Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Giles Wittell. I'm an editor at Tortoise and this is our regular Friday lunchtime Sense Maker Live Thinking brought to you by me and my colleague uh, Claudia. We put together Tortoise's uh, daily Sense Maker uh, newsletter uh, and it's also brought to you by Santander, the bank, one of our founding partners and they support our new slow journalism. And we're great, very grateful to them for that. This is the last of our summer uh, Friday thinkings. And I hope to goodness that by the time we reconvene in September, we'll have something more cheerful uh, to talk about. That may be, that may be wildly optimistic. Um, but our question today is a, if not a cheerful one, it's a pretty urgent one. It is, what are the lessons to be learned from the second wave of COVID or, or for the second wave of COVID depending on where you are in the world in relation to the second wave of COVID. Now, that presupposes that there is one, and I know that some experts dispute the whole notion that, there is, that we're facing a second wave, that we should really be thinking of it as part of the first, a continuation of that, and, and we, can, we can get into that. But I think it's pretty clear from where I'm sitting in the UK, and some of our guests are in radically different time zones, uh, that we, one way or another, do have lessons to learn. Um, since we chose to discuss this subject, and we made that decision at the beginning of the week, the Office for National Statistics here in the UK has confirmed that we have the highest excess death rate in Europe, and I think probably pretty close to the highest in the world. Um, just yesterday, uh, it was announced that 10 northern boroughs in Greater Manchester, in fact, large parts of, of northern England, have to go back into something close to lockdown because of localised um, uh, spikes in COVID infection rates. Um, Leicester is already in that position. And just before we started this session, I noticed a headline along the bottom of the BBC News website saying um, that uh, the easing of lockdown in parts of England, parts of southern England, may have to be postponed. So the government here is clearly trying to learn from some of its mistakes um, uh, earlier in the pandemic. And if anybody wants to itemize those mistakes, I don't think we can do too much of that. Uh, very briefly, for those of you who are not familiar with the thinking format, and I know that a lot of you are, the whole point is to get everyone involved. We regard this as part of our journalism in the sense that it's opened up to you and we will be quite shameless about using any of your best ideas uh, to start us off on the process of pursuing new stories and reporting them out in a more conventional sense. So Claudia is going to be on the lookout for that. We are recording it. It lasts an hour. We will uh, uh, clip some highlights for uh, future use on, on our app, but don't be bashful, please be forthcoming. Um, and here's how to get involved. As you know, you have the chat function. Uh, if you haven't found that, uh, just sort of hover over the bottom of your screen and it'll come up in, in a window. There's Claudia. Uh, and also, if you click on the participants button, um, then you will see at the bottom right hand corner a raise hand option. And that is another way to, to get involved. And don't be shy about using that. Quite often, hands suddenly go up with 10 minutes to go. And at that point, uh, we, we're, people are trying to do summing up. And I will try to get to you. But if, if you think you want to raise your hand, do it sooner rather than later. Um, now, just to check you're concentrating. Um, as we try to judge what is responsible and appropriate behavior collectively at this point in the pandemic. Raise your hand, your digital hand, if you are contemplating leaving home for a holiday, a vacation uh, this summer. Okay, and now leave your hand up if, if your journey is going to involve leaving the country where you are, uh, but put it down if it's not, if you don't mind.
quite a small number planning to leave the country. Uh, and now, if there's only, only five of you, that's making me feel quite guilty, but we won't get into that. Um, now, if you'd like to put down your hands and raise them again, if you think it is downright irresponsible to be contemplating a non-essential travel in the summer of 2020. I won't take it personally. Right, that's it. Okay, that's really interesting. Okay, thank you everyone. So, um, what are the lessons to be learned from the second wave for the second wave? Uh, I want to start, as I was saying to our guests earlier on, um, at a sort of gritty granular level if we can. So I was gonna to come to Ashley St. John, uh, Professor Ashley St. John at Duke, NUS Medical School, NUS standing for the National University of Singapore. Um, I should have been clear from the start. Can I call you an immunologist and an epidemiologist? Uh, immunologist is probably most accurate, yeah. Right, okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us from your air-conditioned splendor in, in Singapore. I have to say that from here, where we have uh, 45,000 deaths direct, directly attributed to COVID-19 and, and many more if you're counting excess deaths compared with the five-year rolling average. We look at places like Singapore and their extraordinary numbers and as we were discussing the, the cumulative death toll, if I have this right, in Singapore from the pandemic so far is 27 or thereabouts um, yes. with a population of, of 5.7 million and uh, from the website I was looking at 52,000 cases. So, so really the question is what has Singapore done right? So that's a great question. I think one of the things is uh, not even something Singapore has necessarily done itself but the fact that once they contained the outbreak to, to individual clusters um, there was a, a demographic shift towards it being people who are very young and very healthy who were being exposed. So um, they've had some outbreaks in the in the residents of foreign workers who come from overseas, um, mostly doing um, construction and um, that sort of job in Singapore, and they're quite healthy. And so the demographics are working in their favor in terms of um, being in the category who are more likely to experience milder disease um, or to be able to uh, you know, recover with appropriate supportive care. So I think that that is one aspect that is a factor in why mm -hmm. um, the survival rate has been higher than some other places. And you know, at the same time, they have been very good at isolating cases very early. So the contact tracing that they've been doing has meant that people have been able to um, receive the care they need from the very beginning rather than coming in too late uh, to receive the proper supportive care. And I think that's another factor as well. Uh, so some of these things were in their control, particularly the contact tracing and uh, just being ahead of the outbreak in some ways, uh, but other factors such as the demographics are uh, you know, just a fortunate coincidence in, the, in that case, because they've had very low community transmission outside of those specific dormitories where workers are, are in the last uh, month or two. Right. So uh, let me pin you down a little bit on that containment to clusters. Mm -hmm. um, we've all heard a lot about how uh, many countries in Southeast Asia, scarred as it were by SARS, uh, have not just memories but also policies in place uh, that we didn't have over, over here. But, but when we get to the details, um, how has the contact tracing been done? Has Singapore relied on phones or ankle bracelets or, or, or old-fashioned policing and, and door knocking? And, and um, what do you regard as essential um, uh, additions to everyday life? For example, masks and, and routine temperature taking. Right. So very quickly, they implemented those types of things, the masks, routine temperature taking. I think it's, a, it's debatable whether the temperature taking is, you know, very predictive, but the masks certainly 
are huge in terms of limiting the spread. And it also uh, was like second nature for people. They have a culture of wearing masks uh, during flu season, for example. And after the SARS um, outbreak, as well, it became commonplace to assume that if someone was unwell, it was normal to wear a mask and that those around them might also want to wear a mask. And so it's not seen as a, um, a you know, maybe an antisocial, uh, you know, feature or something like that, like it might be in some of the Western countries now. So th that's extremely important in terms of containing the spread, in terms of how the contact tracing went. Um, so they have developed some new things like apps that people can download and use and some of the businesses are requiring those uh, to be in place and that will help them with contact tracing. Um, I think that those maybe the success of those hasn't been reported so I'm not sh sure how much better that is than the old-fashioned contact tracing but the old-fashioned contact tracing worked quite well and that was as you said just going around and asking people, uh, once you identify a cluster, um, having those people in the public health sector ready to an interview them, identify their contacts, where they've been, and start tracking them down. Still, you know, a few cases sometimes were um, escaping, but then it's very, they were very strict about compulsory quarantines for mm -hmm. those people who had been um, exposed or were likely to, uh, who had started to develop symptoms or had been exposed. And that really helped uh, in terms of reducing the outbreak early on and managing so that those clusters uh, that did occur were easily identified and could be uh, isolated and treated. And so I think that's one thing that they did very well. It certainly came from the advantage of having the SARS experience and having policies and resources uh, to do that sort of contact tracing. Um, so 100% a critical aspect of why uh, it, it seems to be a little more under control there, I think. Not just a little bit more. I mean, from where we're sitting, it, it, it's, it's, it's like night and day. What is the Singaporean um, length of quarantine? What, is, what do you as a specialist regard as the appropriate length of time? Yeah, so it's about four, so it's 14 days exactly. Yeah. Um, I think that's about probably what's needed. There's some talk of, of shortening it. It probably won't be shortened in Singapore, um, but there's some talk of whether a shorter quarantine would work. Usually the, the people are getting sick about five days after they've been exposed. And one of the most risky things is that it seems to be about 12 hours before that, before they start showing symptoms, that they are most contagious. And so you can have someone who really hasn't done anything wrong themselves. They're not making a choice to engage in risky behavior and go out when they're feeling unwell. They don't feel unwell yet, and they can expose a lot of people. And because this is slightly variable, um, it's important to you know, respect those quarantine orders. And I think in Singapore, they're much more strict about it, whereas in other places, um, it's, it may not be compulsory, it might be suggested. And uh, you know, so they, they also have resources where they are bringing um, things to people. So, you know, you meal services and things like that to facilitate keeping people in quarantine and make it easier on them. And I think Singapore can do that on the scale because they're a little bit smaller country. Um, right. Obviously, that might be difficult to achieve in every country in the world. So that is an advantage that it is an island. They can completely block travel um, and you know, they can also really monitor each and every case. And so far they have monitored every case. And so that's a huge advantage that they have. Right. Uh, one more thing before we go on to uh, Anita. Uh, Mehdi is saying in the chat, um, it is a gross misunderstanding to talk about the second wave in our situation now. And when I mentioned this earlier, I saw you nodding. Do you think that what the world is facing now is a second wave or is, is that? So I think, so, you know, I don't do modeling or something like that where you might be able to identify what, what to call a second wave, but I think nothing has changed about this virus. Nothing has changed in terms of the fact that it does have, uh, you know, this exponential um, transmission rate in some sense if you don't contain it. And we don't have anything that's slowing it down yet. We don't have a vaccine. We don't have, um, you know, better interventions than uh, just the mask wearing and those sorts of things. So I think that since nothing has changed, we have to be always prepared that if we don't um, continue to be vigilant and maintain some sorts of measures like social distancing and wearing masks and even, um, you know, it's strict 
quarantine rules and, and contact tracing, those things can help us keep it under control or there definitely will be a second wave. Um, and, right. and there is a lag, but like I said, it takes you know five days to become sick. It's usually 10 days or so after that uh, that has been the average ICU admission. And so there's a delay in what we see in the numbers and what is actually happening in terms of uh, people being exposed to the infection. And so we have to keep that in mind as well, that at any moment it can actually change. Um, right. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Mehdi, I see your hand up, but I do want to come to Anita first because I, 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 we've got so many things to, to get through and, and they're actually sort of quite different subjects. But I wanted to ask specifically, Anita Charlesworth, you are Director of Research at the Health Foundation and many other things a professor, you seem to be a professor in most uh, universities and you've had senior roles in, in government here in the UK, in the NHS and the Treasury. Um, nearly half the deaths attributed to COVID in this country have been in care homes, if not more. Um, what, in your view, is the, uh, apart from registering that extraordinary fact, what is the practical lesson to be learned um, uh, as we face the prospect of, of resurgent infection levels? Yeah, I, I, think, I think it's quite important to, to think about what we've learned from that, but also as we move forward, what will be different. So what we don't do is uh, work out exactly how we should have behaved in February and March. Uh, what we now need to do is to think about how we skill ourselves up to behave for the coming winter. Um, right. and it is the case clearly actually building on what Ashley said, that we need to think both about obviously keeping the incidence of, the, of COVID-19 as low as possible in the general population. But we do know now really clearly that the impact of COVID-19 uh, on mortality and morbidity is very different for different groups. And we really understand much better now than we did in February, who is at risk. Yeah, and so we need to think very cleverly as well about what we really need to do to protect that population at risk. And it is obviously most critically the, the, the very elderly, but there are other vulnerable groups as well. And acting smartly to understand those risk points, I think, is the lesson we need to take. One of the things, obviously, then, that is much on the government's mind at the moment is how we make sure that we do get really high uptake of the flu vaccine. Yeah. The flu vaccine. Of, of the flu vaccine, yeah. Because we also need to make sure, obviously, that we don't make people more vulnerable by, by them having uh, other diseases, but also that we manage to make sure that we keep our capacity in the, in the NHS. So, uh, so in the first wave of the uh, pandemic, if I'm allowed to call it that, I mean, essentially, the NHS was not swamped, partly because it increased capacity, with the uh, Nightingale hospitals and with uh, essentially buying huge amounts of private sector uh, hospital mm -hmm. services. But what we actually did was we turned the NHS into a COVID-19 service, mm -hmm. stopped huge amounts of other treatment. And we could do that for a short time. We're still not, don't really understand what the longer term effects of that will be and whether or not we'll have indirect mortality from that, I mean, you know, We've stopped, we've halted quite a lot of cancer care for a period, halted lots of diabetic care. You know, maybe you could do that for a short period of time, but you don't want to do that for very long. So going into the winter, we can't do the same. Yeah, we can't shut down for prolonged periods all the rest of the NHS. So our challenge is almost bigger going forward, because if we're living with COVID for a long term and we see spikes, then actually we've got to work out how to provide effective treatment for COVID patients and continue to run an NHS for, for, for people who have other very serious conditions. And we may also see new health needs emerge. So not direct, some of that is directly from COVID. So people don't bounce back at the end of having severe COVID. And it looks like, and we don't know fully what their pattern looks like, it looks like they have long-term health needs that we need to start to, to support people with. But the other thing is that some of the policy action that we've taken, uh, understandably, in the absence of drug treatments and vaccination, will also increase health need. 
So, you know, if we're going to have mass unemployment as furlough ends, typically what you see with mass unemployment is rising mental health issues with the consequence of that. Also, the experience that people have gone through, the anxiety levels, prolonged social isolation, the dislocation, the impact on children and young people, you, it would be very surprising if we don't see significant mental health needs. So we're going to have to run our standard NHS, a COVID NHS, and potentially some new health needs that arise out of this in the context as well where our workforce are exhausted. Yeah? And, uh, and, uh, and, and we have managed remarkably get, to get them to move into this very adaptive crisis response mode and rise to the challenge, but, but people can't operate like that long term. And also, if we're having to rely on these non-pharmacological uh, uh, strategies for COVID, which looks like certainly for the next year what we're doing, you know, we'll have NHS staff, social care staff, all off um, uh, sick or, or isolating for periods as well. Um, so I, I think in some ways the challenge to come is greater and the other thing we need to think about is you know uh, we talk a lot about care homes and care but a lot of people who've got social care needs to get care in their home and a lot of people won't be wanting to go near a care home right this and, and care in people's homes is different to to has different challenges but significant challenges and then it's not so much that the elderly person is mixing with lots of other elderly people who've got COVID-19, obviously they're not, but you've got staff coming in and out, and actually infection control in homes is more challenging because it's a home, not a clinical setting. And so we need to make sure that we do learn the lessons, but we don't think, okay, we've got a good package for care homes, our job done. Yeah? Right. It needs to be fleet of foot and adaptive. Um, Anita, I, I know that Judith has been looking at uh, adaptability and uh, the, the um, tolerance of people for spending more on health, but just very briefly, National Health Service budget, I don't know, about, about 120, 130 billion. Um, the way you have described it is its workload has doubled, trebled as a result of this? At the moment, its workload actually has gone down, bizarrely. Oh, okay. Because, you know, people aren't getting, because we We've, we've stopped so much treatment. Right, but, but, but if, if we're going to do what you say and, and insist yeah. on a full, a full spectrum NHS come the winter, my yeah. question is, is Boris Johnson's promise of an extra three billion sufficient? No, but the, probably, the, so, so the rate limiting factor is probably not money. Yeah, so yeah. the challenge at the moment is I, I think if the government could pay the money and solve the problem, it almost certainly would do that. Mm -hmm. Actually, the really tough challenge is workforce and having enough staff. So, and it isn't just for this winter. So, so some people are saying that, I mean, going into this, we had waiting lists over 4 million, uh, that, that we might end up with waiting lists at 10 million. Yeah, and, and to work your way through those waiting lists, it is almost certainly our ability to, to actually marshal the physical resources rather than the money. And just give you an example, I mean, we're a workforce very, actually very dependent on inflows of qualified staff into the UK. And for completely understandable reasons, and the right reasons, from March, the number of nurses in coming into the country has fallen off a cliff. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we have got people coming back into nursing um, who had retired, but how long they'll want to stay, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Primary care is going to an entire, pretty much entirely digitally first model. Some doctors will like that. Other GPs may say, that's not what I signed up for. It's actually the long term. I did my bit during the crisis. I think it's time for me to go. Um, so we, you know, quite how this will play out, we don't quite know. And it is social care, and one of the really big contributory factors to the spread was our model of workforce. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I want to come in a second to uh, Brahma Mukherjee, if I'm pronouncing your name right. I, I'm told that you have been able to join us from Michigan, for which thanks. But first, uh, let's just go to Methy. You've had your hand up, and you wanted to add something to the business of, of what 
the second wave. And uh, yes. Why it's the wrong characterization. Thank you, Giles. Just want to make a brief point. Uh, I was fortunate enough to actually watch uh, this afternoon's um, uh, briefing from Downing Street. And I think it's important, and I'm not accusing you, uh, but it's important to be very clear with respect to uh, assertion of the second wave. This is not, I mean, anywhere in the Northwest where uh, uh, they are uh, trying to put the lead on is not anything like uh, imposition or occurrence of the second wave. What it is, and I think Chris Whitty put it really nicely, is about observing that the second, the, the, the step-wide relaxation in some areas has gone too far. Yeah. Therefore, is really pulling back, uh, looking at the data, looking at the local data, and the Northwest, and to some degree, Southwest, but not as exaggerated, as enhanced as in the Northwest, around Manchester, Oldham, Blackburn, was being mentioned. They are saying that we have got the opportunity to say, we initiated the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the stepwise relaxation in some areas because Peter, people perhaps gone too far and they, uh, they did not observe it as, as such as in other area. Therefore, before it gets worse, we are actually putting the leak. Oh, right. However, I, that does not, I'm sorry, Joe, very quickly, okay. it doesn't mean that we are not going to encounter uh, right. the second wave that you refer to come October, November, perhaps December. I think that is very important to know. Otherwise, one will be uh, accused of, uh, of uh, uh, calling wolf, if you like. Um, no, I take your point. I, I, and it, it, it's well made, uh, absolutely. Um, as I said, I wanted to go to Professor Mukherjee. Uh, from uh, the University of Michigan, if, if we can join you. Um, I don't, because I know that one of the things that you have been looking at is statistics on a, on a grand scale. Uh, can you tell us uh, what you think of as the lesson, the lessons that we need to be internalizing now from uncounted cases. I read an absolutely astonishing thing that you said uh, with respect to India, but I'm sure that this is applicable in many countries that, uh, and this may already be way out of date, uh, that you estimated 20 to 30 million undetected cases in India rising to 100 million within a few weeks. Um, is, is that up to date? And if so, uh, with what fatality rate and what sort of second order effects? Oh, I, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for coming thank you as well. Much. No, thank you very much. Uh, it's early in the morning, so my brain may not be functioning as well. Uh, so I apologize. But uh, I think that this was based on the Cero study. So constantly in our epidemiologic models, we're predicting the number of reported cases. But we also had number of unascertained cases, a huge number. But we had really no way to validate that in India because that's an unobservable. So unless you test everybody, you are never going to know that. Another alternative is to do the seroprevalence studies. So it was the, my conjecture was in terms of the Delhi seroprevalence study, which Can actually- Can you just explain showed, for those of us who don't know exactly what a seroprevalence study is, what it is? Yeah, so, so it is the antibody test where right. you see the presence of IgG antibodies. So it is a sign of past infections. And I'd like to clarify that it does not necessarily mean that you are immune to the disease. Right. So it's a sign of past infection. So India did that study in Delhi and astonishingly, 23% um, of Delhi's population appeared to be uh, affected. And so that means that the number of case counts in Delhi should be around 5 million and the reported one is 130,000. That means that we are seeing only 2% of the cases and so if you calculate that if an underreporting factor of 40 or 30, then you can take our usual projections and multiply. So we, we project and in terms of number of reported cases about 3 million by the end of August in India. India is 1.6 million right now. And if it, this is an ascertainment factor of one out of 30, one out of 40, 
then uh, you can easily get to that number of 90 million that I said. And another thing I would like to point out is that this ascertainment factor is um, not, no, none of the countries have been able to ascertain every case, but you can sort of get an estimate of this through various methods. And in US, it's about one out of 10. That's, the, that's what the CDC says, that's what some of the models say. But in India, because of low testing, in the highly populous nature of the country, uh, it is uh, around 22% in Delhi. But of course, Delhi was a hotspot. So yesterday, there was a study from Mumbai that came out, which showed 60% people in Mumbai slums were seropositive. So these are astonishing numbers. And so at the same time, it probably gave us some hope too that so many people got infected without getting into hospital or severe outcomes. And we know that even if it does not mean immunity, the chance of an infected person coming close to a person who is uh, susceptible is getting down if so many people are already infected. So the co concept of herd immunity is probably coming to fruit in some parts of on some communities where there is a hotspot. So, so that's where the, uh, the unacertain, the ascertainment factor is what led to that projection of uh, latent cases. Okay, so is it then um, legitimate now to be looking at the global south for want of another uh, shorthand and whispering that perhaps for a variety of uh, demographic and social reasons, even though infection rates may be very high and getting higher, um, we may not be uh, anticipating massive loss of life. So in India, you know, if you uh, take the observed um, death data, so it is, it is actually really remarkable that about only 30,000, uh, um, right now I think it's about 35,000 deaths have been reported. And given India is 1.38 billion people, this is really a small number of fatalities. So there are several hypotheses that some of the hypotheses regarding the infection fatality rate being uh, low is probably definitely true for India uh, because of its younger population and also probably some pre-existing immunity. But uh, I would also have to reiterate that the death data is severely underreported often in India. One right. out of five deaths are not medically reported in normal circumstances. And now with COVID, we have no calibration, it was mentioned earlier in the conversation, how to quantify excess deaths due to COVID and other causes. So we do not know. But I did a calculation, but even if you assume that with the current data, if you assume infection fatality rate is 0.1%, with underreporting, you can get to 1%. But if that means that if, you, if we let go, if we take, off the, take our foot off the brake, then if 50% people in India get the disease, even with 0.1%, 0.1% is influenza, uh, infection fatality rate, there will be six, about 700,000 deaths. So we are not prepared to incur that. So we have to sort of put all of these numbers into our hat as we think about different approaches to controlling the disease. That's it. Yes. I mean, the, the, the sheer scale of the population that we're dealing with means that um, numbers are going to be uh, huge, uh, even with such a low fatality rate. Uh, but thank you very much. Um, um, we're already zooming through the hour, and I, I want to come to Professor Judith Balcastello in Barcelona, where you're an associate professor, um, and covering every aspect of this, as, as far as I can tell. You've turned off your fan, which means you must have closed the window and turned on the air conditioning. Uh, yeah. I know, I know what's going on there. Um, <laughs> uh, as I mentioned, I want I want to broaden the conversation out, if possible, to um, what do you think um, the economies can stand um, uh, if we have to live with this uh, long term? Now, you've, you've done experiments and studies, as I understand it right, on um, citizens' uh, appetite for, for increased spending on health care. But, but can, we, can you start by hazarding uh, an answer to the question uh, are is is one of the lessons of the of of the second wave or the first wave that um, uh, lockdowns of the kind that 
you went through in, in Spain and Catalonia before we did, uh, are they worth it? And, and, and uh, should we be prepared to go that route again? Yeah. So let me start by answering the question and then I'll move to the study that we've developed. Sure. So I think in March, uh, when the strict lockdown was imposed in, in Spain, in the whole of Spain, that was a necessary condition because um, the spread of the virus in Spain was really, really, really high. We didn't know the measures to be taking uh, to, to control the virus. We didn't know the drugs that were needed. Uh, for patients that were severely ill. We didn't know um, how much capacity we needed in hospitals to treat all these patients. So everything was very much um, without control. And so we needed this, uh, because we, know, we knew, the, one of the probably the only things that we knew was that lockdown would work, that a lockdown would work. So at that point, I think the government had no choice but to implement the lockdown. And at least in the case of Spain, but also in many other countries, it clearly worked because mm -hmm. for 15 days, everybody was uh, quarantined at home. And we saw that the numbers went down pretty quickly um, after the first week and uh, especially after the second week of lockdown. So I think that that was a necessary, um, a necessary condition and a necessary measure to be implemented at that point in, in time because we, we were slow, we didn't know um, how to treat and how to contain the virus. So at that point, that was the only thing that, um, that we had um, in our hands to do. Now, I think that this is quite different right now because of several elements. Mm -hmm. First, the population is more knowledgeable about their own responsibility and the actions that we all have to take to contain the virus. So we know we have to wash our hands very regularly. We know we have to wear the mask. Now the mask wearing is compulsory in Spain, everywhere, outside, inside, everywhere. Uh, we know that we have to keep some social distancing. We know we have to limit the different contacts that we have when we go out. And so we know several things. The population knows several things that we didn't know in March. Then the government also knows other things um, which can you know, help them uh, take some more targeted measures and not so broad measures like a lockdown. And then hospitals also, or the medical profession in general, they also know many more things. They know which drugs work, they know how to expand capacity quickly in their hospitals, they know which patients need to go into the intensive care units, mm -hmm. which ones uh, are not, uh, don't need this. They know how to use the personal protection equipment, which was something that at the beginning we didn't know, because unlike the Asian uh, countries, we had no previous experience with SARS, Ebola, or any other of these mm -hmm. very, very contagious viruses. So in that sense, we had a couple of experiences in which contagion actually happened within the hospital, which is the worst that can happen because you already have some frail patients inside the hospitals. And because we didn't know the medical professionals did not have experience on wearing all these very kind of complicated mm -hmm. personal equipment, uh, personal protection equipment. So we had this, uh, this kind of very bad experiences, which then was very difficult to, to, to kind of uh, surpass this situation. So now the hospitals also know all this. And I think that the system, the healthcare system is much more connected now. At least uh, I know that this is the case in Spain, but also in other countries. Primary, the primary healthcare sector was very kind of independently working from the hospital sector, for example, or also within disciplines, within medical disciplines, there was a kind of separation uh, right. of the different disciplines. Now everybody, I think the healthcare system has responded um, pretty impressively. Uh, I think they've made an extremely difficult effort everybody involved in the, in the healthcare system, in the public healthcare system in this case. And so I think they've, they are much more integrated now, they are much more flexible, and, and that all these elements from the population, from the government, and from the healthcare system, I think may, can you know, give us some hope that we will be able to avoid these massive lockdowns. Now, okay. we have to be very careful because we've seen that the situation, the economic situation is also kind of worrying everywhere. Everywhere is pretty worryingly uh, everywhere. Uh, we've seen that in the US from the 1950 
uh, we have seen the worst uh, GDP decline mm -hmm. uh, in in the in the history of records of the GDP uh, series. Uh, similar thing is happening everywhere in Europe, in Germany, in Spain, and so we have to be careful because now this uh, this GDP decline can be temporary, which I think you know then we will be able to to like kind of um, get out from the recession pretty rapidly. But if the virus comes stronger again in the fall, at least in Europe, and we don't do the right things that now we know we have to mm -hmm. do, uh, then the, the last resort option is again to go to a complete lockdown. And that, and that would be economically devastating for the country. Right. Um, I, I saw in the chat, uh, I think it was Alice Hodkinson uh, saying quite tartly um, that uh, anyone questioning lockdown and the epidemiology is seen as an enemy of public health, presumably to you, Alice. Um, uh, from what you've just heard from Judith about uh, greater public awareness, greater knowledge on the part of medical professionals and hospitals, um, are, you, are you satisfied that, that we've reached a point where we can question the, um, uh, the use of the sort of blunt instrument of, of a lockdown uh, and, and trust to, the, to what we've learned? Can we go? Can we go to Alice? Yeah, I'm here. Um, I so so that that rather tart uh, message was in the context of um, a thread that I've been um, writing with Lucy. Um, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, right. And and so it's really in the context of um, how um, there have been so many awful things that have happened to people with lockdown, such as. Um, uh, um, you know, when people die, uh, people are dying alone in hospital. Uh, young uh, young people going into to surgery into theatre in hospitals on their own without having somebody with them. Um, uh, bereaved people not being um, having no not being able to see their loved ones uh, as they're dying. Uh, you know, all these these awful things that are happening. Um, and um, and and we were just sort of kind of. Uh, going through this sort of questioning about why we haven't been shouting about this, why this has been allowed to happen, this complete lack of humanity. Um, and, um, and, and, and my feeling is that we've just got into this situation where we have to do, um, um, you know, lockdown is the thing that matters, isolation is the thing that matters, um, and actually humanity is being lost. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was just about to respond again that the um, a further lockdown, it doesn't, it, it's not just the economic impact. Yes, the economic impact is appalling, but it's the personal impact. It's the human impact. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that's just devastating. Um, and we're just not getting it right at the moment. Um, there's also been um, a f very, very few people questioning the epidemiolo epidemiology of the lockdowns. Um, and you can look at um, uh, the way other countries, states in America have, have done lockdowns. And you, um, um, the, the, it's interesting with that, uh, the, the information from India about just how many people have been exposed to uh, the coronavirus. And of course, that's the tip of the iceberg mm. because having antibodies isn't the only way that you get immunity from coronavirus. There's, hum there's, the, um, um, there's other parts of the immune system which um, are, are likely to, have, uh, to be producing immunity too. Um, um, so, I think we're just not getting the models right, um, and we're not getting the humanity in there. <laughs> That's right. my rant. No, good point. And, and I'm glad I came to you because I completely misunderstood what you were saying. <laughs> by 180 degrees. Glad we cleared that up. Um, and, and I want to go back to Singapore in, in a second uh, uh, with a question uh, about drugs, among other things. But first, um, Cla uh, and uh, Lucy Hoogman's got her hand up, but Claudia, is there anything um, that... Uh, You've noticed in the chat that uh, I'm skating past or misunderstanding. Um, so I think, yeah, as Alice mentioned, we've been having a very interesting conversation um, about mental health. And I think in particular, this idea that um, for some people, they might have become um, slightly desensitized to the kind of trauma that's being experienced and how actually a lot of people have had to 
um, kind of put their emotions to one side just to be able to get on with this. I thought there was quite an interesting conversation going on. Um, and, and this is mainly uh, healthcare professionals? Well, I think a mix of everyone, actually. The, the person, um, I'm just trying to find the exact, I think it was Daniel Dipper, um, one of our regular thinking attendees, who mentioned the fact, um, he was saying, you know, that as the longer this goes on, the more he's had to, you know, come to terms with it himself and become slightly desensitised, obviously. Um, right. Can I, can yes, I Judith, jumping? of course. Can I jump in? Because, yeah. so we ran a survey in the midst of the pandemic in Spain. So that, that was in the 2nd and 3rd of April. We ran this survey uh, to representative uh, a part of the Spanish population where we asked uh, two blocks of questions. The first one was on mental health and the second one was on the willingness to pay for to finance to increase the financing of the healthcare, the public healthcare system. So as you mentioned, we found that 80% of the population was willing to to pay a new tax. So it's this is uh, their, their pocket money, a new tax to increase the financing of the public healthcare system. And in particular, we asked about which of the elements of the healthcare system where, where we had to prioritize and in, in, the, in the context of the COVID-19 uh, pandemics. And the, the population seemed to prefer to dedicate a bit of more of this new tax to increase the intensive care unit beds, the number of, of beds, to then the sec in second place to, to, to fund research, to, to find uh, a vaccine. And then in the last place to fund also research to find some drugs that were able to treat the disease. And, but 80, I think the remarkable thing is that 80% of the population were willing to pay this new tax to increase the financing of the public healthcare system. So this is one thing. Then on the mental health side, we found strong deteriorations of the mental health of the population. So we Sorry, asked- strong, strong what? Deteriorations. Right. So strong uh, reductions or strong, in, so strong increases in the, bad, uh, yeah. in the bad mental health outcomes. So we asked about four main questions about, you know, whether they were feeling sad, whether they were unable to cope with the daily obligations, whether they had trouble sleeping and were, whether they felt depressed. And in all of these four dimensions, there Judith, you've uh, frozen on me. Um, uh, so like Claudia, can you- Increases of 40% of the people that uh, were unable to sleep or had problems sleeping, 50% uh, increases in the number of people that, um, that were feeling anxious and depressed. Uh, but this was in the short term. So we are planning to run the survey again um, at the end of the summer to see whether some of these elements have improved, but we saw strong deteriorations. Thank you. Um, let's go to uh, Lucy Hoogman and Daniel Dipper quickly. And then I do, as I said, want to, I, I want to come to all our speakers again before we're out of time. Lucy. Okay, um, I'll try and be quick. Um, I, I think the, the conversation that was going on in the chat was started um, by some, uh, an article I've actually written that I think David and James are looking at, which is about the sort of underneath the surface, underneath all the adrenaline, underneath all the pandemic um, lockdowns and everything that we're doing is um, millions of people who have lost relatives and also mm -hmm. um, workforces so frontline and social care work workforces in this country and other countries that have been called upon not only to work long hours in dangerous conditions but to make kinds of decisions that they may not have all been trained to make so a lot of decision making sort of lower down um, and there's been some writing and some quite good case examples of this thing called moral injury which is what I write about mm -hmm. which is a a recognized precursor to PTSD. So um, I think it was interesting to hear about surveys of the population, but what we were talking about, and I don't know if it's particularly in England or the UK, is that all of the things that you normally do, you know, you care for a loved one in hospital, you visit them in a care home, you perform funeral rites that might be traditional, cultural or religious, you go to funerals, you, whatever you do, normally you, don't, you can't do now, or you can do in a very mm -hmm. limited way. 
And there's sort of, anyway, there's just millions of people in this situation and staff. So um, it's not being talked about at all. And I was asking, is it just an English thing? Is it a stiff upper lip thing? Is it, a pan you know, because we're adrenaline of the pandemic and mm. journalism and politicians scrabbling every day to make sense of facts and figures. Um, but, you know, I don't really understand why everybody's not crying. It's a great point. And I was going to ask... Um, There's lots uh, of data. I've sent it all to various editors at Tortoise as well. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask, uh, but it would sound fatuous, uh, what's, what's the lesson? How do we deal with this? Um, well, I can, I, can, I, can, I, can, I can tell you what some people are saying. I mean, there have been suicides of doctors in New York, not just in the Far East. I mean, it's already happening. Yeah. Um, well, one um, eminent professor who I'm speaking to, who is in England called Professor Neil Greenberg. He's a military psychiatrist. He was in the military for 25 years. He's been a researcher in the field of battle. He basically said in the middle of May, now I'm going to write, this is the article I've written. <laughs> um, he said in the middle of May that um, frontline staff should be considered to be the same as military returning from the field of war and they should be offered therapy for PTSD. He outlined you know, how that should be done. Um, this was in the context of Mental Health Awareness Week, which was barely recognized at the time because so much else was going on. Right. So I've looked, I have actually, anyway, I'm not going to go on about it. I've looked into it. There are, there are things available. I would just say it's difficult to write about now because the case studies are sort of brewing. You know, there are people prepared to talk about that. Um, I mean, Alice was telling me about a relative. We've all got probably someone we can, we yeah. can talk about or we don't want to talk about or whatever, but it's hard journalistically to say like you did with the cleaners in the Ministry of Justice. It's very hard to say, you know, these are the stories right now. You can say these are the signs right now and you can, you can point to, you know, things that can, that can be done. But I think one of the things that can be done is to talk about it. Yeah. You know, um, and someone in the chat mentioned there were some hospitals that have set up um, talk facilities for staff to process what they do. It's very hard to process it when you're doing it. I mean, when you when the adrenaline is there and the emergency there is there, that's not when it happens. I mean, I know about it because um, you can get PTSD from arrested grieving cycles, for example. It happened to me 10 years ago. So that's why I think I'm particularly attuned to it you know, because my PTSD came back this year and I wondered, why is it this year? And I thought, well, it's because so many people are grieving. Right. But they, but not in the way they usually do. So there may be seen to be a soft story, but I think there are going to be a lot of cases and it adds to the, the question of mental health. And in terms of recovery, we only talk about economic recovery, but if your workforce is unwell, like, like they were saying, the professors about the, the staff are unwell, they may not want to continue. They may they may say, right, you know, it's too stressful or whatever. Their families are going to complain. Um, if your staff aren't well and your workforce aren't well, then your economic recovery can't work. And it's the same as the same idea is being applied by the government to school kids. So that children who are seen to be have fallen behind, the government's putting in loads of money to, you know, to pay for tutors, to individually helicopter yeah. into individually disadvantaged kids. But if they're traumatized, you know, they're traumatized by being cooped up at home or they're traumatized by going back to school, whatever it is, they can't learn anyway. It's a complete Absolutely. waste of money. The recovery is different. The recovery is about the person. Lucy, thank you very much. Okay, sorry. I mean, these are uh, important and massive uh, points. Daniel, let's come to you. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to keep it brief because I do want to uh, okay. get back to our guests before we run out of time. Daniel. Yep. Um, so, I mean, I think a lot of this stuff will become clear as we go on over time. And I think that the inquiry that ha they have said are gonna, is going to happen, I think is most probably when we're going to have this national moment of we come to terms possibly with what has happened. Now, I don't actually think that's going to happen within the next year. Um, so to be honest, I hope there will be a time when it's over and we can do that. But I think when we get to that point, that is kind of when we're going to look back fully. I think now, just to kind of briefly try and answer the question about what can we learn as such, I think mm -hmm. the only 
times currently we're going to be looking back at is in terms of care homes what can we do differently about that and work on a long-term solution for that you know education we've got to get that back on track i think we do need to start seriously thinking now about the mental health impacts and doing something now because it is only going to get worse as mm -hmm. Lucy, who's one of those, um, and i think that's kind of the only times we're going to be looking back i don't think we're truly going to come to grips with this until hopefully we get to that day when we can say it's finally over but then we have this inquiry, which will most probably be quite shocking what it contains. It's a, it's a really good point that, that the timing of the final reckoning uh, is, is not obvious. When, but, but let me now ask um, Ashley in, in Singapore, uh, what would you say was the single most important lesson for, um, I say this uh, solipsistically, the... Um, uh, heavily hit economies of Western Europe to absorb as we head from summer into into autumn on a practical level to limit the impact of the virus given that it patently hasn't gone away. Is Ashley still with us? Actually, you uh, know, now I'm unmuted. Oh, that's good. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so I'll, I'll start again. So I think the important thing is, um, you know, the, that we have to go by the data. Like we, you know, I, I think it's becoming uh, tiring for people to continue these measures like the, the lockdowns and the continued social distancing. Um, but I think it's important to use a data driven uh, approach to assessing it. So some things like zero prevalence has come up. And uh, as an immunologist, to me, that's an important aspect even in these countries in, uh, like in, in the US and in Western Europe, both in cities that have had pretty bad outbreaks and, and quite a strong burden, this, the seroconversion is still close to around 10% or so and, and fairly well done studies. So I think it's important to realize that a large portion of the population is still very susceptible to infection. And although it's very uh, tiring um, and taxing on all of us. It's important to continue to look at those numbers and, and make a decision whether it's worth it to you to really raise the, um, or I should say lower uh, the requirements for these types of lockdowns. And is it something we're willing to accept what uh, would be the result, which is that a lot more people uh, would probably be exposed to the virus and that they, they would still be naive. So I think we have to continue to uh, follow some measures. I think Singapore has done a fairly good job in having a phase two. So there's something between a lockdown that is a total lockdown, which they did for a month. Um, and then they moved into phase two, which is very relaxed in some ways. And you can have still have some small groups of friends get together and things that people were really craving. But at the same time, um, it's, you know, the workplaces and places where uh, transmission seems to be greater, such as the nightclubs and mm -hmm. church services are still operating under extremely tight regulations so that the contact tracing is much easier when it, you know, was a, a group of friends got together uh, versus, you know, a huge um, party of some sort. And so I think, you know, maybe something like a phase two uh, would be something that other countries could look towards uh, doing and it, it has a name people know what it is they know what the requirements are and so it's easier to comply with it than just an on or off uh, type of, of uh, lockdown. That's a great thought I think we're definitely going to look up Singapore phase two I'm sorry to, to uh, uh, keep steamrollering on but um, uh, Anita you said we know uh, much more who's at risk now uh, what is your view of the single most important lesson for Matt Hancock, let's face it, in the next few months? I think it is to be ag agile and anticipatory. So uh, I want to pick up the points that people made about, about mental health. So, you know, we have to try and this pandemic through a forward view mirror, not a rear view mirror. And we need to think now, what are the new challenges that are coming as we come out of one period of, of experience of COVID-19 and into the next and get ahead of that. So, you know, it, it is so likely that we are going to face very significant mental health challenges. Mm -hmm. So everything points to that. So don't wait and then scrabble around for a response. 
start there. Thank you so much. Um, uh, can we go to Michigan? Uh, Bramai, and I still don't know if, if that's the correct pronunciation. What is the single most important lesson that you've derived from watching the pandemic unfold so far? Yes, so um, for me, I think that there have been a couple of lessons. One is that I'm a modeler and I realize that models are important, but I have also realized that human beings can trump the models and that's the best moment when your projections are actually defeated by adherence to non-pharmaceutical uh, intervention. So that's one thing. And the second thing I've realized is that political leadership really matters at a granular level in order to coordinate uh, the different sectors of the government and in terms of public engagement, community support. It's really this, uh, uh, but somewhat of a cliched phase of we are all in this all together. Mm -hmm. And I uh, the third thing for Western countries, I think it's in, incredibly important uh, that in the societies in US and you know I come from India is very much based on individual immediate gratification. And there is not a concept of collective social sacrifice. And this is the time which is calling for that from humanity. And I think to really found ourselves some philosophical basis and look for some nourishment for the soul, uh, I think is incredibly important. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. Um, great points. Uh, they uh, get my heavy felt pen treatment. Um, uh, Judith in, in Barcelona. What, what's your, your highlight takeaway, your most important lesson? Yeah, I think in the Spanish case, uh, we've seen that, you know, it's very important to have massive testing and also uh, a good, a very good contact tracing system in place because some of the pretty bad outbreaks that we had uh, in the last month uh, were, uh, or a great part of them, were caused or were, yeah, we lost control of them because we didn't have this system of massive testing and, and contact tracing in place soon enough so as to avoid um, these this small uh, outbreaks to get, uh, to get bigger. And so and I think sorry, this Can I just be... ask about contact tracing? From, from your observation, do you need high tech or can you have effective contact tracing with people and telephones and knocking on doors? Yeah, I mean, I think that right now, I don't know what, what's gonna be the case in the fall if, the, if, if everything deteriorates, but I think right now we've seen that some places in Spain which had like, as you mentioned, contact tracing by people calling and uh, so contact uh, through phone and with, without these uh, massive IT technologies, they weren't. So I think that for localized outbreaks, it, it will work. I also know that some of these IT, like some apps in Germany also, also work pretty well, but then you, because you cannot force people to install these apps in, in their phone, you need to rely on their willingness to take this uh, responsibility. Um, okay, thank you all so much. It's, it's three minutes past, we're in injury time. Uh, that's not a, not a very apposite uh, analogy, but I feel that we've learned a lot. I mean, just in, in the last few minutes, important lessons, massive testing, which echoes Dr. Tedros from the WHO, contact tracing, which works and it doesn't have to be high tech. Um, as Bremer said, uh, a sense of collective solidarity sometimes helps, especially in societies which are more geared to individual gratification um, and political leadership uh, at the granular level. We're having uh, uh, demonstrations of that all the time. Anita reminded us of the importance of looking forward, not just learning the lessons from the first half of the, of the pandemic, but anticipating those of, of what's to come. And uh, Ashley, among many other things, uh, pointed me towards Singapore phase two. Uh, we're gonna take that off the shelf and see if we can put it in front of some of our leaders. Um, and, then, and then embracing and over all this, I think everybody seems to have agreed that the mental health toll on um, patients, on health workers is, is massive, unacknowledged, and uh, unaddressed. And, and, and if we don't do that, um, then pr frankly, all, all the practical steps in the world will be, if not for nothing, then, then uh, a good deal less effective. Thank you all for joining us. Join us again when Sensemaker Live resumes uh, 
in September. Um, and have a great whole, um, summer insofar as that's possible. But um, thank you, Ashley, Judy, Grandma, and, uh, and, and Anita, especially uh, for joining in all, from all your various time zones. It's been a really good conversation and uh, have a great weekend.